Good day and welcome to the National Reunification Month Innovative Practices to Promote Reunification Conference. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Rachel Thomas. Please go ahead. Thank you and hello, everyone. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. As was previously mentioned, this webinar is being recorded. It's interactive and includes polling questions. If you have any technical difficulties during the presentation, please contact Shanti Bullock at the email address listed on the screen. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please send us a message through the chat box. If we are unable to address all questions, we will answer the remaining questions in a frequently asked questions handout that will be sent soon after the webinar. The PowerPoint and additional resources referenced in today's presentation will be available for download. This webinar does feature a video later on. When that time comes, if you are dialed in by phone, please unmute your computer speakers. The sound is being streamed from your computer or device. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Taffy Campaign from the Children's Bureau. Thank you very much and good afternoon. My name is Taffy Campaign and I'm the National Foster Care Specialist at the Children's Bureau um, under the Administration for Children and Families. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar in support of National Reunification Month titled Innovative Practices to Promote Reunification. The Children's Bureau, along with our uh, technical assistance partners at the Capacity Building Center for States, are pleased to take this opportunity to promote information sharing on best practices supporting healthy and lasting reunification. As you're aware, reunification is the primary goal in the majority of cases where children enter foster care. It's critical to a stable and lasting reunification that systems develop strong processes and services that support this goal and provide the necessary training and resources to staff to address the issues that have affected the family in earnest and to reunify the family as soon as possible. We certainly realize that this is a difficult and intricate endeavor many times uh, as there are often multiple compounding issues to be addressed which require a multiple, uh, multiple excuse me, multidisciplinary approach to building the family's own capacity to addressing and mitigating the issues. To that end, we have a wonderful group of presenters from two child welfare agencies who have adopted a set of principles that guide reunification work holistically and really engage the caregivers as well as important team members uh, in, in doing key strategies to bring the family to reunification. With the agency staff, we also have the great opportunity today to hear directly from parents and caregivers who benefited from these interventions, and I want to particularly thank them for their insight and their time. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jennifer Marcelli to talk about the webinar today. Thank you so much, Taffy, and good morning and good afternoon to everybody on um, this call today. Thank you all for joining us. Um, my name is Jennifer Marcelli. I'm the Program Area Manager for Foster Care and Reunification for the Capacity Building Center for State. Um, and I'm just quickly going to go over our agenda for today. Um, I will briefly introduce all of the folks you're going to hear from today. Um, we're going to see a video about what the Quality Parenting Initiative is. And then we will go into hearing from um, Washoe County, Nevada on their Fostering Relationships Through Visitation program. And then we'll hear from Louisiana on their Parent Partner Program and the Extra Mile Family Resource Center. And then we'll have time for question and answer um, at the end. So feel free as the presentation is going on to enter questions in the chat box. Um, and we'll keep track of those and, and we'll ask those of the presenters at the end of the conference. Um, so you just heard from Taffy Compain and myself. Um, on the call also is Joan Morse, our program area advisor, um, and the state foster care director's constituency group lead. Um, from Washoe County, um, Nevada, you'll hear from Alice Ledesma, um, who works for the Department of Social Services there. And then you'll hear from Gloria Torma and Diana Pooley, who are parents and caregivers, as Taffy mentioned. And then from uh, Louisiana, we'll hear from Melissa Thompson from the Louisiana Department of Children and Families, Evangelina, Evangeline Bordeaux, the Extra Mile Family Resource Center, um, Leslie Calloway, um, who's also from the Louisiana Department of Children and Families, um, and then Barbara Calais and Tiffany Carroll, who are caregivers and parents working in Louisiana. 
Um, next, I'm going to briefly go over our learning objectives for today's webinar. Um, we intend to increase awareness of quality parenting strategies that increase placement stability. Um, also, um, participants uh, will be able to identify best practices to support innovation in reunification program development, um, increase knowledge of practices to promote positive interaction, um, increase awareness of interventions that support reunification through those partnerships, um, also to increase awareness of products and resources to support those efforts, um, and then, as Taffy mentioned, um, a big highlight for today is hear from caregivers and, and parents who will highlight and celebrate their roles um, and their experience as those valuable partners in reunification efforts. So next, um, just moving into what is the Quality Parenting Initiative, um, we're going to do a polling question. So if we can move into the polling question, when it comes up on the screen, um, please answer the question, which is, how familiar are you with the Quality Parenting Initiative? So it looks like um, a lot of folks haven't heard of it. So we're going to um, show a quick video um, that is going to give some information um, on the um, quality parenting strategies. Um, the video um, was um, created uh, for a specific program in Clark County, Nevada, but we just wanted to show it here because it really emphasizes the creation of partnerships that can happen through the efforts that our, our two um, jurisdictions are going to talk about today. So if we can move to the video, um, as uh, Rachel said in the beginning, uh, make sure your audio speakers on your Adobe platform are turned to green. It's um, up in the top left-hand corner. I think what QPI can do is bring everyone to the table and let them get to know that we all share a common goal. So even if as a foster parent that wasn't your initial plan for being a foster parent, when you really get to know why kids do better in their family and who is working towards it and how that can happen safely and in partnership, then everyone sort of can work together for the same goal. It's when we're not speaking to each other that we have the problems that we may have. And so I think QPI bringing all the different components of who's on the child's team in the same room is what allows that sort of reunification partnership message to come home. The more we get to know each other, understand what roles we bring and how we can work together for kids, the more people are working together. So it's not just staying partnership, it's being in partnership with all the community partners, with the DFS workers, and with foster adoptive and kinship families and birth parents that bring it brings it all home for people. So I've seen that aha moment where you're sitting at the table and you realize, oh, okay, we all have the same goal. We might have had different ways of getting there, but now we're working towards sort of a common goal. And so for me, seeing the partnership and what's come out of the work groups has been huge. That partnership agreement that's come out is a really, really big piece for kinship and foster parents. It's huge to sort of set, this is how we're going to work together for the child. So it really brings everyone back to, this is not about anybody other than what can we do for the child. Um, okay, so next we are going to move into Washoe County, Nevada. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Alice Ledesma, and then when um, they're done, we'll, we'll hear from the Extra Mile Family Resource Center in Louisiana. Alice? Thank you. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, we're going to talk about today our visitation practice, um, fostering relationships through visitation. And it um, is based on a QPI practice that um, we learned. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that and give you some foundation. Um, it is based on uh, some research that we participated in called ABC. Um, it was the ABCV, which was a, a, a practice and a research um, project, which is, stands for Attachment and Biobehavioral Catch-Up. Um, it's a, a theory that is based on coaching parents to follow the child's lead. Uh, it was a very specific um, project that was based on children ages six months to six years. And 
it was the, the nuts and bolts of it was that the visitation was based in a mentor working with biological parents and foster parents to coach them during visits to specifically follow their, the child's lead and understand the concepts of trying to lessen anxiety during the visits um, and actually foster some relationship while learning about the child's needs, both the, both the caregivers, um, both the foster parents and the birth parents, learning about the child's needs, and in the same time, uh, kind of learning about each other and fostering a relationship together. Uh, the foster parent remained in the room during the entire visit and encouraged that follow the lead practice and behavior that was exhibited by the biological parent and that teaching moment. So through that, um, it was, it was a, a pretty specific progress and program that we documented and looked at outcomes and we found some, some pretty successful uh, things that happened during visitation, meaning reunification rates. We went from supervised to unsupervised uh, very quickly. And the placement stability, because of that relationship development between the caregivers, was uh, very high. So what had happened was that we took those theories with ABCV and we uh, generalized them to our visitation practice. Next slide, please. So what we did in, that, in, in learning about that foundational um, uh, practice through ABCV, we help that, uh, we use that to help our, define our visitation. Um, and what we really did was um, that um, we took that and we changed our philosophical approach to defining visitation. And what we had to do was change the way that we look at visitation at all. And we felt that visitation, in a formal sense, should go from that a parent is seeing, engaging, enjoying time with a child. And um, while it is you know, a lot of documentation, but it's not something that should be used against parents um, or documentation about parenting practices, that it is not a way to make a decision about what is happening in the case plan, um, that it is a evaluative situation for um, the case plan or even a decision making we had to um, make a shift in our practice that visitation is just what it is. And um, it's really about uh, enjoying time. And we moved from uh, the, the point of view that visitation is just what it is. Um, it's really nothing but spending time and getting to enjoy the situation. Um, so we have um, a couple of um, questions here that um, you might uh, be able to answer and some of the challenges that we had. And you might put down um, what are your common challenges that you have either as parents or caregivers in visitation sessions. Um, and some of those things um, that you know, we struggled with are, might be common to you. And what strategies do you have in your agency to address those challenges? Um, and you know, I think that you'll find that, that they're common. But if you can put down what are your most common challenges that you find in visitation, go ahead and you can just type those in there. that people have had some challenges in visitation. Um, 
and and those are those are challenges um, that that certainly are common. Um, how how often supervised visits versus not having appropriate space for visits to occur. Um, foster parents not wanting to build relationships with bio parents. Um, they're not long enough, frequent enough. Um, those are those are all um, bio parents angry or resentful of foster parents. Uh, those are all uh, challenges that we certainly were looking at, and um, frankly, why we really quickly agreed to participate in the rigorous study with ABC. Um, and what we found uh, with our visitation practice was that um, it was really based on and, and addressed with this relationship development. And when we felt like we could change our perspective on um, what visits were for, how they were handled, and what value we gave them, um, some of these challenges uh, became less. And when we changed our judgment about some of these things, um, we were able to strategize. Um, the strategies that people have um, telling families that foster care um, isn't just child care, it's family care. That is a premise that's an excellent strategy. Um, we use the term um, co-parenting and um, giving people permission to, um, to develop that relationship to co-parent um, children. Uh, it helps, the, helps both caregivers and it helps the, the children um, so that there's, uh, you know, kind of an understanding, uh, lessening of anxiety about loyalty issues, um, using community spaces when possible for visits. Uh, that's um, a, a great idea. We're in the process of building a visitation center that is foundationally uh, supportive of, of co-parenting. Icebreaker meetings um, with our visitation uh, practice and co-parenting. We felt that um, we, we saw that we didn't need to have as many formalized icebreaker meetings because the foster parent and the um, the natural parent was already kind of foundationally having these type of icebreaker meetings on their own. Um, you know, they were, during the first visit, they were starting to establish that communication, the, that exchange of information, um, setting up. Uh, ideas for, for activities on their own, figuring out strategies where they could visit, things like that. So those are all um, fantastic strategies uh, to try to combat some of these challenges. But these are all challenges that we did and, and still do struggle with. But um, this change in our idea uh, gave us a different perspective on those. So those are fantastic. So um, all of those things that um, we talked about, the, the challenges um, led us to take our experience with ABC and um, talk about enhanced visitation or this fostering relationships that um, QPI supports. And um, you know, this visitation goes poorly often because of those things that everybody talked about is the child is uncomfortable with the situation, there's anxiety, um, birth family members, relatives, um, extended family may expect this intimacy too quickly. They have this expectation that kids um, will, you know, after a separation, after this trauma of whatever has happened, is that, you know, the kids will kind of bounce back quickly and, um, you know, birth parent may feel rejected by their child. They have They've missed their child however you know, long it's been, either it's the next day or two days when the visit is arranged. And birth parents may feel threatened by this relationship that the child has with the foster family or the relative caregiver. And there's loyalty issues by everybody involved. And um, additionally, birth parents may not have developed skill for in interacting appropriately with their child, which um, you know, they, they don't know how to visit. It's, it's an odd and uncomfortable and unnatural um, setting and structure. And those are the things that we had to 
identify and understand and um, try to plan for. So these are the reasons that we took our experience and wanted to develop them and apply them across all of our visitation for all age groups, for all settings, for all situations, which you know, led us to try to put them in place every time we had a visit. Um, the potential outcomes that we have and um, that we're seeing by this, you know, the, the study that we um, participated in, um, I talked about those, those increased outcomes uh, that we saw that um, but fostering relationships have seen is that um, the, the birth family will, uh, you know, feel a, a stronger relationship with the, the caregiver, the, the foster parent or the relative caregivers, the kin caregivers, and feel more supported by them, this relationship development um, will lead to more pleasant interactions with the child. Um, they, they won't feel, the birth parent won't necessarily hopefully feel rejected or have um, kind of the inappropriate or, or false objections or false ideas of what will happen in visits and um, can have a more realistic uh, expectation of what will happen in visits. This, um, is part of the coaching process that we have with um, we have paraprofessionals that will coach um, foster parents and bio parents about what will happen in a visit before that visit starts and then use the moments in a visit to say um, you know this may have happened because of this or uh, you can expect this and eventually foster parents learn to do this is a kind of teaching process with the, the um, follow the lead uh, training. So um, there's, there's less disappointment and less anxiety for children in that. Um, both the foster parent and the birth parent learn to follow that, the child's lead and they learn to ha be anticipatory of what's going on. Um, and through all of this training and learning and um, expectation, Foster parents and birth parents tend to develop a more positive relationship based on this parenting, um, just natural parenting of uh, the child in common. So it's this kind of mutual learning, mutual relationship development. Uh, the outcomes, the expectations of these things, which we have seen and which is, are the goals of of this practice uh, is, is the comfort level, uh, birth parents relying more on foster parents as opposed to caseworkers, agency staff, uh, the, the mentors, the coaches, the paraprofessional staff, birth parents and foster parents, caregivers relying on each other to support and provide direct information regarding the child. Um, they, they're co-parenting the children and um, Agency staff are uh, benefit from the co-parents making arrangements for children. They're, um, they're scheduling information that needs to go back and forth. They're, they're taking care of visits. Um, they are, they're managing that aspect of the case, which is more reliable. Um, uh, you know, it takes out the middleman type of thing. And, um, birth parents and foster parents uh, can, can make supportive and positive decisions for the child. Uh, in turn, the child tends to feel more comfortable because both of their care pro providers are either in the room at the visit um, or if they've decided that they're, you know, they, they move to offsite or lack, you know, they change the supervision, they, um, they don't have those loyalty issues that are going on. Um, and the anxiety level is, is, is lessened. Um, visits just simply go better for everyone. Um, and they, as I mentioned before, they go from supervised to unsupervised to off-site sooner. Um, and our evaluation of placement stability was increased. Um, reunification simply happened sooner. Um, 
And so you, you can see that those byproducts of the environment is calmer, um, birth parents feel a closer connection to kids, and uh, the visits in, in general are a more positive situation. Um, the, the stark differences between that, um, as I mentioned before, is that we had to make a, a philosophical, a cultural, or a value shift in um, our visitation practice, which um, was, a, was an agency shift. It was a stakeholder shift. It, it had to be with caregivers. It had to be with staff, management, um, and that um, our, our visitation practices, we had to you know, really take a close look and evaluate those things. Um, previously, visitation was not always timely. Um, and some of the things that people mentioned, you know, the challenges was that it wasn't frequent enough. It was not consistently scheduled. Um, parents had expectations on how children would react. We had expectations of parents about that you know, they, they weren't prepared for the visit, um, their timeliness. Uh, it, it was more of a, a punitive situation. It was rigid. Um, if their child did not respond the way that they expected, uh, you know, they they had values about what that meant to them, and we didn't particularly um, may have not provided them explanation about what that might have been from a child development standpoint or a trauma standpoint. Um, and so we we were not participating um, from a, a, a level that was, you know, case planning or trauma-informed, and we had to uh, reevaluate how we wanted to participate in that. Um, these are some more points that we used. Um, one of the things that was, was particularly a shift for us was that um, visitation was used as a measurement tool towards um, success of reunification and evidence of parenting skills. Um, birth parents often feel that that is negative, and I think that that is a, a consistency in a lot of child welfare agencies. Um, is that it's a it was an unnatural setting um, that you know you, you're in a small room and somebody's observing you and taking notes, and that is just odd. Um, and uh, children have you know negative reactions. To, to that and um, their emplacement, and um, that was, was something that was pretty standard and that we had to, we felt like we had to reevaluate re based on our experience with how, um, what we were learning. Um, they, children also have, you know, lots of reaction to their placement and their caregiver, and they're in a different situation, and so they, they can bond quickly um, with with foster parents, with, with their new caregiver, and that's confusing to everybody involved. Um, and we had to acknowledge that and try to help people work through that. Um, and it, you know, visitation previously was more stressful to everybody than rather just what it is really meant for. So this uh, kind of conflicted feelings for everybody we had to address about attachment and uh, making a more positive uh, in, in a situation. So the the opposite, or the you know, either even just the corollary of fostering um, relationships is that talked about this paraprofessional staff coaching um, birth parents and foster parents to be in the visit and being more real realistic of expectation about a child's reaction, coaching them through kind of each visit, especially in the very beginning from the very first visit. Um, this mentor coaches both the birth parent and the foster parent to ch follow the child's lead, to take lead from the child about what would be an appropriate expectation, to not um, you know, force the child to do too much too soon. Um, especially in sibling visits, different age groups. Um, the mentor discusses giving the child time to come to the birth parent, give them affection rather than the birth parent forcing that interaction, those types of expectations. Um, birth parent 
is you know is is giving the is given the opportunity to observe the interaction with the child and the foster parent while while being coached with those types of things to help alleviate concerns about them and um, the encouragement is to build a trusting and positive relationship and try to work through some of those um, adversarial or concerning situations um, that, that birth parents can feel about being replaced or you know, having some doubts in their abilities to be the parents and, and they're um, giving confidence and uh, uh, given some encouragement about their role as well and given explanation about co-parenting. Um, the outcomes of, of those things, and we talked about some of those things, that, that, that the birth parent feels as supported as the foster parent and supported by the foster parent, and uh, the child feels more comfortable in that, and um, that this, this paraprofessional on our staff um, is a, kind of a neutral person and can be observing and, and kind of intercede if there's questions or things go, you know, arrive and keep things back on track. And this paraprofessional also helps them with their case and offers wraparound services. So there's kind of this triad of people trying to help um, make people be successful uh, with the reunification of their, of their family. So um, they engage in this. We find that visitation is, the, you know, is a really important part of that, but that there's a, a whole... Um, plan for to try to get families back together and that the foster parent or the caregiver is a really important part of that. So with the foundation of that and lots of talking, I appreciate your patience. Um, the real um, the, the real people that you know can can speak to this are um, you know caregivers and um, birth families and Washoe County is, is very fortunate to have very engaged caregivers, and um, we try very much to include birth families and caregivers, and we have seen some amazing success with this visitation. So I'm um, really fortunate to have lots of choices of people that are willing to talk about their experiences. Um, I have with me um, Gloria Torma, who is um, an amazing person who's an adoptive and foster parent and works uh, tirelessly with our faith-based initiatives and can speak on a whole bunch of perspectives about our visitation program and its successes and challenges. Um, Diana Pooley is a biological parent who has participated um, and has quite a few experiences and um, has just recently had her children return to her and unfortunately was unable to actually make it today, but um, she sends her um, apologies. But I believe that Gloria is able to give us quite a bit of perspective. So I turn it over to Gloria Torma. Thank you, Alice, and thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to share a little bit today. I couldn't possibly add on to any of the explanation that Alice already gave for what our program is, but what I can share with you is a little bit of the personal experience having started foster care in the previous model and now being in the model for visitation we use now. I have personally found it to be really great. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time in training talking about the foster parent's role in the restoration of the family, but we don't always enter into our first placement and our visits with the right tools and skill set to know how to do that. And this ABCV model has really helped with that because we are able to receive the training on, on how to anticipate some of those different feelings that come up from the biological families, how, how to redirect those interactions, and most importantly, how to make the kiddos that are in our care feel comfortable and have smooth transitions into the visit and after the visit, which most of you know that's a pretty emotional time, especially for the little guys after a visit. So with that, the tools have empowered us to be able to work closer with the biological parents of our children, which has been great. It expedites reunification for sure, and in those events where reunification isn't possible, it still made that time that the child had 
with their parents and the visits better. Um, the last parent I worked with, we had a great relationship due to this model and has been reunified now for about four months and doing really well. And she had children in care prior to the child that I had. And she made reference to the difference all the time in the amount of interaction that we were allowed to have. Of course, you know, clearing with the social worker how much interaction was OK. But then within those parameters, being able to interact and support and support her to be able to support her child. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, if Diana was here, I think she could speak to that obviously so much better than I could. But there's a lot of benefits for our biological parents in using this model and getting another support. When our parents are working their reunification plans, they can't have too many supports. And why not the people who have their child? Um, I think it's beneficial for us as foster parents as well, because in having that open relationship, I feel like we reduce the potential for allegations or misunderstandings when children are sick or visits have to be missed or any number of things go on, because there's enough of a relationship there that we don't need agency mediation, that we can say to a parent at a visit, Timmy fell down and he hit his head and that's what that mark is, or hey, Timmy's struggling with math in school, and to be able to have those conversations as co-parents. Um, So all of those things are ultimately most beneficial to the child. And then being able to, to see the difference in the parents as time goes on. That, that parent in the first visit is very standoffish and very closed and somewhat unresponsive. And to see as the time goes on, and they're working their plan, and they're getting their training, and they're building their skill set to be able to actually observe the difference between that parent who presents as disengaged to the parent who suddenly is giving hugs and kisses and very appropriate with the child and seeing the child respond to that in kind. So it's really there are no negatives to the model. Of course, it is child welfare and it is not always perfect and there are hiccups. Um, everyone has to handle those hiccups situationally with their workers. But I do feel like the, the potential for conflict is lessened with this model. And when conflict does arise, we just take each situation as it comes. But the model provides a really friendly, safe foundation to avoid that as much as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Gloria. I think that's perfect. Um, so with that, um, we will um, certainly answer questions. But um, I would like to turn it over to Melissa Thompson with uh, Louisiana. And we will her hear her presentation. Hello. Good afternoon. This is Melissa Thompson. I'm an area, di area director with the Lafayette Region Department of Children and Family Services um, in Louisiana. And I have several presenters with me today who um, have been excellent in quality parenting work that we have um, initiated in our region and in Louisiana. So I will, I will have them introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Leslie Calloway. I'm a foster care supervisor with the Department of Children and Family Services. Barbara Calloway, a foster parent, and a partner, too, of the foster parent. Tiffany Carroll, parent mentor with the Extra Mile Family Resource Center. And my name is Evangeline Boudreau. I'm the program director for the Extra Mile Family Resource Center. Um, I want to start off and just say thank you guys so much for um, inviting us to be a part of this WebEx. We're excited to be here. We're excited about the work that we're doing here in Louisiana. Um, I'll just give a really brief description of what we're going to do. We have, there are five of us presenting. There are several of us working with the Extra Mile and also two people working with the Department for Children and Family Services in Louisiana. And we're going to kind of bounce back and forth. Um, so I guess we can just say who we're with when we, when we, get, to, um, when we get to everyone. Um, so again, I am with the Extra Mile. And we are an agency that contracts with DCFS to provide services um, historically to, to, or at least for the last 10, 15 years, so to birth parents and their children. But 
um, but long ago and, and now also to foster parents. Um, so I'll be talking about some of the work that we have done and some of the work that we're, that we're doing now. Um, I wanted to start off, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, our parent partner program. Um, we've done this for a while and we've been doing this since before we introduced QPI here in our state, but we think that um, it, it's been, I think it was, it kind of paved the way for us to do some of the work that we're doing with QPI, so um, we thought it would be good to talk about it a little bit here. Um, I know that lots of states have programs that are probably similar in nature, but just so that everyone has some language. A parent partner is someone who has been involved in child welfare. Um, they have had their children removed due to child abuse and neglect, have worked their case when successfully, um, were reunified, and now serve as mentors to parents who are currently in the system. Um, next slide. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so just a little bit of background about our program. We started this in 2011. Um, we, we had some help from some national folks. We did lots of focus groups, lots of, um, lots of town hall meetings, lots of meetings between um, the stakeholders and our various levels of DCFS staff and our courts and birth parents and foster parents and really tried to get everyone to the table. The, I think the biggest thing that we, we wanted to talk about and wanted to address was to make sure that we, um, we knew there were going to be stigmas on everyone's side, um, that, that, that birth parents might have, would have feelings about DCFS workers, and DCFS workers might have feelings about birth parents and stakeholders and courts and, and all of that. So we wanted to make sure that we were able to come together and uh, really talk together about what we were aiming to do. and. Um, and kind of have a level playing field. We were able to do that. I think that we um, we had a lot of input from from everyone. Our courts were very helpful. They were very supportive. DCFS at all levels. Um, we had support from the right people in the right places. So our, our local staff and our supervisors in our, our in our our regional area um, promoted and supported what we were doing. Um, we were able to get us referrals and parents and worked with us to establish exactly what job duties and all of the nuts and bolts would look like. And at the state level, um, uh, I, think that they, I think that our state folks just really wanted, wanted this and wanted to have parent representation and wanted to hear what parents' experiences had been and um, what we could do better. So we were able to get people there with money and resources and all that good stuff. Um, next slide. Thanks. So, we have a two-pronged approach with our program. Um, the first is um, work, our parent partners work with, work with par parents who are involved currently on an individual level. Um, so they mentor parents who are currently involved. The other one, uh, or the other prong, is that we want to make sure that birth parents are included in the larger system work. And so the parent partners that we have do a lot of work um, with, with state and regional folks, um, sit on committees, um, and make sure that kind of the collective parents' voice is brought, um, brought when, when policies are being discussed or practices are being discussed and changed and all of that kind of stuff. Next slide. So to the program today, um, we have two or three parent partners, kind of depending on, on where we are. They are, um, they are full staff of the extra mile um, and all, all, you know, everything that it means to be a staff person. Um, on the individual level, some of the things that we think have been helpful to, uh, or one of the things that we think have been, has been helpful, helpful in reunification is that there's not a time frame on services. Families can be kept open as long as necessary. We often see families stay open with the program for, um, for several months after reunification has occurred to make sure that there is some support there. Average caseloads tend to be about 15, um, but go up and down. At the systems level, um, they've been able to bring, bring that parent voice uh, to, various, to various places. They served on different committees. Um, they presented at our, our big state child welfare conference that we have here, at the social workers conference. Um, we had someone that was invited to speak at the, uh, the, the National Association for Council, uh, for, of Council for Children conference. We've had um, one of our parent partners invited to uh, speak to policymakers and senators in Washington, D.C. about their experiences. They have really been able to, um, to talk about their experiences and what they've been and, um, 
and I think help, help shape some practices. They also attend um, both DCFS new worker trainings and foster parent trainings. At the DCF trainings, they started going to them just to get the information. Um, but we found both at those and at the foster parent trainings that our parent quarters really do give people, um, um, help people to, to, to know that th this is what a parent looks like on the other, other side of things and that people really can change and that, that the birth parent that you see today can be a very, very different birth parent tomorrow. Um, and I think that's a lot of what they've been really good at doing is, is giving, um, giving everyone hope, including the birth parents that they're currently working with and staff that work so closely with them. Um, they're also working with DCFS in Louisiana to develop a substance abuse training curriculum that is specific to DCFS staff. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Um, okay, so these are some of our outcomes. Um, so these are going to be similar to, to what other states have seen. Uh, we have a small sample size of actual data, um, but what we've seen so far indicates a decreased uh, rate of repeat maltreatment. And the observed benefits, um, this is a few, but I think overall we've seen a, an increase in system engagement. And this, in, this includes engaging with all partners. Um, I think most, um, probably most importantly, DCFS staff and foster parents. Um, we've also seen increased visitation where visitation um, wasn't consistent or there are lots of missed or where they were maybe weren't happening as often as they were supposed to. Um, Parent partners have been really good at advocating for birth parents and, and kind of getting those back on track. Getting visitations in the home where they're appropriate. Um, like Alice was talking earlier, visit, visits can be a really stressful time for birth parents, for children, um, and sometimes just moving the location can be helpful in, in, um, in, in helping those be a little bit less stressful. Uh, more positive relationships. With the, with the birth parents and the various people they come into contact with. And some of those cases that just seemed stuck, that just weren't going anywhere, um, we, we were able to see those move forward and, um, and, uh, and ultimately result in reunification. We've also seen, and this isn't up here, but um, we've seen families um, after, the, after reunification call when they get into a little bit of trouble and are, I think, able to, to, to use the parent partners as a, as a safety net um, to prevent, um, prevent further involvement. Um, next slide. Okay. And now I'll talk a little bit about the um, um, a project that we began working on since the rollout of QPI. So last August, we applied along with DCFS to complement some of the QPI efforts that were going along here uh, to receive a grant to really look at the relationship between birth parents and foster parents. We had found that that's an area that we really wanted to focus on. And some of that was a result, I think, of, um, of having our parent partners involved in our initial QPI talks. Um, and we, we saw a divide between the birth parents and foster parents and thought that was an area that we needed to do some work on. Um, so the grant uh, that we applied for and were awarded um, offered three components to these family units, which were comprised of a, a, a foster parent, the birth parents, and the children that they share. And we were able to offer um, some, some mentoring components to each one of the, both the foster and birth parents around why a, a relationship is so important, why it, what it means for them to have a relationship and what it means to the child. Um, there was also a component written in to have a meeting with them together to talk about, again, why it's important and then how to do that. What works for your particular or what you, your specific family? Um, what are you comfortable with? What can you do? Um, so to make a, a contact plan or a continued contact plan to what that might look like after the meeting. And finally, we would conclude the, um, the little series with an art or music project, depending on what the child would like, that, um, that would have all three, the, the child and then um, both sets of caregivers together. And just as a chance to um, have them spend some quality time together, give it some structure, but have them spend some time together outside of all of the baggage that comes along with the DCFS um, system. So we have begun work on that. It has 
think, opened some doors for us and, and given us some insight into some more of the things um, that we'd like to do. And with that, I'll turn it over to Melissa to talk about some of the other QPI efforts that have gone on here in Louisiana. So when we started with quality parenting in Louisiana um, from the department standpoint, we um, we already had discussed, Evangeline and I working with the extra mile, uh, the importance of improving the relationship between the foster and birth parents. Um, we knew that there, there had been some contentious relationships between birth parents and foster parents in our region, and we wanted to diminish uh, those the contentious relationships and improve the relationships uh, between the foster and birth parents. So we had talked um, and uh, we were very excited uh, about the project launch grant. Um, and when Carol Schofer came along uh, and started working with us with quality parenting and she did the, the focus groups and the kickoff sessions uh, and we started discussing um, some of the committees that would be formed and some of the work we, we would be doing. Uh, when she mentioned the icebreakers and we decided um, that to be one of the projects we would be embarking upon, uh, we were really excited, um, Evangeline and I, because we had begun already the work uh, around the project launch grant. And it was totally aligned uh, with the icebreakers that we um, would be working on through the Quality uh, Parenting Initiative. So we knew it was important. Um, we'd be uh, building communication. Um, the building communication project definitely aligned closely with the icebreakers. And um, the icebreakers would be the responsibility of our child welfare staff. Uh, it would set the groundwork for uh, the building communication project through the project launch grant. And we wanted to ensure that the progression from the icebreaker meetings to, uh, the, I to the uh, project launch grant would be seamless. Um, so we did develop a, a referral project, a referral uh, form or referral process to actually uh, ensure that once we completed the icebreaker, uh, some of those cases would be referred over to the project launch grant. Uh, from the de department side, um, we knew it was important to find champions, uh, people within our region who were excited and enthusiastic uh, about quality parenting, about the icebreakers, uh, about improving communication in general between foster and birth parents. So we were able to, you know, find those champions who were willing to be lead on different committees. Uh, and it was important for us to, um, you know, follow up with that and get the, get the people in, involved on the committees. We knew that we needed input from uh, birth and foster parents on the committees. And, um, you know, we did get birth parents and uh, foster parents who were really enthusiastic and interested in working with us on um, improving outcomes for foster children and working on building those relationships and providing the input that we needed to ensure that we were um, getting the information and uh, uh, touching on what was important to the people who this would be, uh, you know, directly impacting. Uh, from the child welfare standpoint, we had to secure buy-in from staff. Um, and in order to secure the buy-in, we had to share the benefits of this project with staff. So um, talking to staff about this being a team approach to reunification, uh, that when foster parents support the work that the birth parents are doing and they have a, an improved relationship, that our reunification efforts, um, you know, are, are easier and uh, hopefully we can get to reunification quicker. Um, building that relationship between the foster parents and the birth parents, you know, is extremely important and we knew that we had work to do around that area. Uh, less involvement with department uh, staff around scheduling visits, around, you know, phone contacts, 
and around other forms of communication like Facebook and texting. Uh, and the foster parents and the bird parents, um, through the icebreaker work and the building communication projects, could um, schedule those activities without involvement of DCFS. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, and now Leslie will uh, discuss some of the strategies that we utilize. Okay. So project, project Launch's focus is to ensure foster parents have the information and support for working with parents. Also that foster parents clearly identify their role as being supportive of the reunification process. Um, as well as building trusting relationships between the parent and caregiver, which is really important to the success. We also incorporate nat natural opportunities when possible for interaction between the birth and foster parents. Um, we encourage as much contact between them, um, even as much as phone calls, you know, uh, in-person meetings uh, to develop more on the engagement. And we encourage more opportunities for the parents to be involved in regular day-to-day activities, uh, school activities, sports, extracurricular activities, anything that would just make uh, a normal relationship for parents um, or shared parenting. It is DCFS's responsibility to share with foster parents the parameters and types of acceptable activities to empower foster parents and normal, normalize relationships with birth families, um, focusing just that safety of a child is never compromised. Um, Project Launch was a natural transition to develop foster parent mentors, and through the QPI committee, uh, the formulation of foster parent mentors continued to evolve. Uh, important parties that were um, put together to, um, on this committee to get, get input were the birth parents, um, our home development unit, which um, recruits our foster parents, um, the foster parents, um, the foster care staff, and the Resource Center um, were all essential in the success. And I'm going to turn this over to Melissa. Uh, of course, um, any project uh, comes with challenges. And uh, in Louisiana, we definitely had some challenges along the way. Uh, in Louisiana, we are known for yeah, hurricanes and now, unfortunately, also known for uh, some major flooding events. And we had uh, a major flooding event uh, in August of 2016 in Louisiana, uh, and it delayed um, the project. The workers um, were deployed to work disaster relief, emergency preparedness, and um, as everyone in Louisiana knows, when um, emergency preparedness happens, all hands are on deck. So we had a lot of staff who were working uh, disaster relief during that period of time. Uh, we did plan the rollout. Uh, in conjunction with um, QPI in December 1st of 2016. And uh, fortunately for Vermilion Parish and for our uh, for Lafayette region, there were no removals in Vermilion Parish in the month of December. Unfortunately for uh, the icebreaker meetings and for uh, uh, the project launch grant, there were no removals in December of 2016. So that was another uh, a challenge that we had, and so we had to do things a little bit differently. And uh, instead of having Vermilion be the, the pilot site, we had to move and um, get Lafayette involved. And Leslie Calloway um, and her staff were really instrumental in starting the icebreaker meetings in Lafayette Parish and getting um, some families uh, referred to the project launch grant. Um, we realized um, how much foster parents uh, need support, especially uh, around working with birth parents. So that became something that was um, a, ch a challenge for us um, because we found out that you know we had foster parents who were resistant to working with uh, birth parents, and we had to find a way to um, actually handle that. And um, the foster parent will you know speak more to you about. Um, what she did to accomplish that. And then we found out that uh, we had birth parents who were also resistant to working with foster parents. And we have the birth parent here who will talk about um, that challenge and how she's worked um, 
and develop some strategies around uh, working with birth, birth parents. So I will uh, turn this over to Evangeline again. Hi, okay, this is Evangeline again. So I guess probably the biggest thing for us that came out of the, the rollout of QPI and um, really coming together as a team and then applying for um, for this grant that enabled us to do this project where we were looking at bringing birth and foster families together, um, we realized just how, again, how badly foster parents needed support and how much we needed to, to assist in, in supporting the development of the relationship between birth and foster parents. Um, you know, the, the way that we currently, or the way that things have, have been done, um, I'm always reminded that, that someone at the end of the day will likely lose out on a child, and it really winds up being almost a competition for a child sometimes, and that's not the way that it needs to be. Um, and we have so many models of, of, um, of, of a different way to do that. We have some absolutely wonderful foster parents who have, um, who have really embraced working with birth parents, who have a lot of skills around working with birth parents, and um, we've been able to tap into some of that in, um, and have been talking with DCFS and with all the folks at the table in developing this foster parent mentoring role. Um, so it started as a real simple conversation, um, but uh, we <laughs> asked for funding for a position and uh, were granted it from our state. Um, so we're excited to begin developing that role. So some of the things that we've already done in looking at how foster parents can mentor um, really both other foster parents as well as birth parents. Um, this slide talks about some of the things that we've already been doing. So at our agency, the XWAL has begun incorporating foster parents into visit coaching services. Uh, visit coaching is a model that we provide. Um, it involves a staff person coaching a birth parent during a visit. Um, it looks a lot at bonding and attachment and developing a, um, a, a healthy and beneficial relationship between the two. and um, we have begun in incorporating many more foster parents, that kind of that safe base and that safe person for a child, especially for very, very young children, um, when we see that there's some distress when they're separated. Um, we have a parenting class that we provide that involves uh, family time that also is sometimes stressful for small children when they're separated from their caregivers. And so we've be the same thing, we've been incorporating some foster parents to help with um, help with the separation, but also to help assist in, in building specific skills with birth parents, and we've seen a lot of good successes with that. We've been able to send set, family sets that include the, the foster and birth parents and the children to, um, to a Disney on Ice special event, and so I think everyone had a, had a good time with that. That was successful for our families. And um, we began working with DCFS on the development of this particular position. We have rolled out our grant project. Um, which, which again was that series of three meetings that included the mentoring component for birth and foster families, included that um, communication meeting between the two sets of caregivers, and finally that, that musical art project that included the caregivers and the parents um, and the birth parents. So I wanted to, uh, we want to give our parent mentor and our foster parent mentor a chance to talk about what some of their experiences have been with the work that we've been doing around our state. Um, the next slide, please. And first, I'll turn it over to Tiffany Carroll, who is um, our, our, one of our parent mentors. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Tiffany Carroll, parent mentor with the Extra Mile. I'm also a biological parent. I'm a mother of four wonderful children. That includes a set of twins. Um, as a parent mentor, uh, life has been great being able to help families and um, mentor them through dealing, you know, navigating the DCFS system. Um, with our project launch grant that we've uh, been working on, is I'm very thankful to have the opportunity to be helping with this. It's been an amazing time and journey through all of this. Um, what we've accomplished, I guess, in, in doing these, uh, the project launch is we're seeing families between biological parents and foster parents uh, 
communicate more. It's showing them what they can and can't do, uh, letting them know it's okay to have relationships outside of what DCFS tells them that they can or can't do. Um, we had one foster family. Uh, they thought the dad didn't care about the son due to not asking about um, the child or not showing up for appointments. And it was sitting back and watching them go back and forth and coming to the foster parents coming to understand that even though they were telling their worker the, about the appointments, that worker was not relaying the information to the biological dad. And so they just had this sour outlook towards him. And because of this project launch, it was like when they told him that, it, the dad looked at him and was said, I fight every day for my son. And when he, can come, when he comes home, y'all can still see him. And the foster parents, they were able to relax at this point because it was a very tense, you know, moment during all this time. And um, and because of that outcome and because of that meeting, and then the, when they went on to do the project, the project was awesome. They did the little handprint project, the art for the as an art project. And uh, now they talk every day through Facebook. Um, when I saw the biological dad. Uh, Last week, he was like, everything's going great. It's doing a lot better than what it was. And another family that sticks out really uh, was they did not know if they could do this or they did not know if they could do that. And when we started talking about ways to bridge that gap of communication, um, they were able to uh, say, we were able to, as a team, come up with ideas on ways to involve both of them. And just foster parents wanting to go pick up the mom on a Saturday and go sit down and go eat, you know, and hang out. Um, for that particular family, um, the the foster parent didn't have an update on where mom was at and what was going on with the case. And the mom sat there and gave the uh, at a full disclosure told the foster parent exactly where she was at and what was going on with her. Um, that's been the, the, you know, like I said, the stuff that sticks out that has been amazing. You know, of course, we've had our challenges. I've had uh, birth parents just tired of fighting and they don't want nothing to do with the, uh, their foster parents or I've had, you know, it's so foreign to them and it's, been a challenge to get them engaged, but we, we've been working on it, and it's been uh, working out for the for the better. With anything, any new adventure, you always have your ups and downs. But I think uh, looking going forward, I think it's really, really amazing. And I'm going to turn it over now to Miss Barbara. Thank you, Tiffany. Barbara Colley, uh, I'm a um, mentor for the foster parents. In order to uh, work or be a mentor to another foster parent, it was very important for me to get the uh, foster parent to look at self. Uh, from a foster parent point of view, uh, looking closer at how vulnerable uh, we are through our journey. Uh, the emotional pain we, we love, we care for, and we become a mother figure to a child and have to make peace with self to let go. Uh, we are susceptible to temptation. We want uh, the best for the child and sometimes feel that we have to uh, be more or, or we have more to offer to that child. But with working with the bio parents from the beginning of the placement, we go into the journey with a broader overview of the, the bio parent and his or her journey. Empathy is developed early on, which makes it much easier to work with the bio uh, family. The focus is to work together. Uh, we make the journey of the child in foster care to reunification with the biological parent as 
natural as possible. The goal then is that the child can feel that I can live with some caring people and mom is still close by. They all love me. Uh, the child is, the child's attitude uh, or uh, they can get really attached to the foster parent, but it is up to that foster parent to try to uh, get the child to work or get closer to their own uh, parents. There's lots of work to be done. Uh, it is a challenge, but I think together we can make it successful. One thing that the uh, a lot of the uh, foster parents are now feeling is that there's no empathy towards them. Uh, so I know that there, that's one thing that needs to be addressed, and we can all look at it and still work together. Okay, and again, this is Evangeline Boudreau with the Extra Mile, um, and, and both Melissa and Tiffany have mentioned there, um, there, there have been some challenges. There have been, we saw a lot of resistance, especially early on, um, between both sets of caregivers uh, towards working with the other, and so we, we knew, and we still know, looking at developing this position and developing, and, and looking at the work that we're, that we're doing, um, that we, um, that, those are, that this is an area that we really need to work on. So we want to make sure that when we're developing the position of a foster parent mentor and providing support to foster parents that we're, we're really thinking through what we're doing, that we're providing, um, providing them something that they need um, in a way that's going to be most helpful. So the fir the, the, um, this particular slide looks at our plans and the things that we're working on now. So the first thing that we're looking at doing is developing a steering committee um, that includes different units from DCFS, that includes foster parents, birth parents, to see how we can most support foster parents. Um, and once, mentor, once the mentors are hired, we're, the various job duties that we're looking at now include um, uh, looking at foster parents, new foster parents who are getting their first placement and weekly phone calls, um, or actually several, several weekly phone calls for the first few weeks, um, just to check in and see how that placement is going. We know that brand new false parents get incredibly busy, it can be really overwhelming, there's a lot of things going on, and they may not even have the time to, to reach out, and may not even have the, the, the frame of mind to formulate questions, but if someone just reaches out and says, hey, how are things going, um, and just has a conversation, um, they can probably get some uh, a lot of good support. Um, and the same thing, when we know that a child that has some difficult behaviors is going to be placed with a foster parent, to be able to um, kind of be proactive in supporting that foster parent. We're looking at facilitating monthly groups between birth and foster parents and children that are in enrolled in our parenting class that, that has family time between birth parents and foster parents. Um, and also group or one-on-one -on -one support as needed for foster parents. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. One of the things that we know is a, a big issue for foster parents is at least acknowledging the grief and loss that comes along with, uh, with being a foster parent. Um, again, this is a, 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 the system can kind of just be full of loss, and for foster parents who are, are constantly having to love a child and let go of a child, um, we want to make sure that, um, that they know that, that they're appreciated, that they're needed, and do whatever we can to support them. So we're looking at some ways to support them through that, either, again, either one-on-one, -on -one, um, if, if that's most beneficial, or in group settings where they can have a support group around that. And then looking at kind of thoughtfully transitioning children um, during reunification and also replacement, and looking at how caregivers can um, can co-parent with each other, uh, looking at doctor's appointments and looking at sports, you know, sports and church and the various things that go along with everyday life and how 
caregivers can work together to, um, to, to include each other with those things. It, respite care, if a child is reunified, if a child goes back to that birth family, um, often we hear that foster parents want to be connected, want to remain connected with that child and don't want to lose that relationship. And the child doesn't want to lose that relationship with someone who's cared for them for that time in foster care. Um, and, and I can't think of a single foster parent who I've talked to who has is, who is not said, I want to be available for, you know, if, if a birth parent needs a babysitter or just needs someone to watch a child or is just going through a stressful time and might need a little, you know, a couple of days to regroup or something like that. Um, and, uh, and, and also, how can, how can foster parents be supportive of reunification? This is something that we've talked with foster parents about through our project launch grant. Um, I think for us it's been really interesting work. It's, it's helped give foster parents um, just some, some things to think about um, and some ways that they can continue to be involved. Uh, and finally, And finally, we're just looking for uh, any opportunity to create natural interaction between parents and caregivers wherever possible. We are now going to turn it over for or turn it over to Melissa for questions and answers. Thank you, Evangeline, and and thank you um, to all of the speakers um, from Washoe and Louisiana that talked about your programs. We're gonna we have about 10 minutes for question and answer. There were a few that came through the chat box. Um, as uh, the presentations were going. So I will ask those to the presenters. And if, if folks on the line have other questions, please feel free to chat those in. Um, so um, Alice and other folks at Washoe, um, one of the questions that came in for you all was, what have been some of the observations using this process with visits with teenagers? Um, well. That's a challenge. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think that um, we have, we, I think that there's a couple of questions in there. And um, the visitation model is, um, it's applied and the expectation is across the board. And um, that we have worked to apply this for all age groups. And that um, it's certainly easier to follow a th two-year-old's lead than it is to follow a 15-year-old's lead. Um, but that we, we work with foster parents and um, uh, bio parents to apply those concepts and to understand um, developmentally where a child is and where their relationship is. And um, the expectation is that we that we will, and we will apply the fostering relationships uh, practice model in all uh, visitation uh, situations. So with um, older kids, we will set up opportunities for the birth family and the foster parents to engage in those uh, practices and follow the child's lead and and take their cues on how they want to visit and how they want to engage um, and 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 try to to you know foster some interest in what's going on and um, have that conversation. So the the bottom line is that you know the expectation is that we will do these types of visit practice with everyone. Great. Thank you so much, Alice. Um, to um, the Louisiana folks, I think maybe Evangeline, you can probably answer this question. Um, one question that came through was, are there issues of utilizing parent partners who by definition have a history of abuse and neglect perpetration? And has this created any problems due to not passing child abuse, neglect, and background checks, which are normally requirements for child care providers? No, actually the, the requirement for the parent partner position is DCFS involvement. That's the definition of what the position is. Um, there is a lot that went into that particular position around um, um, time that has time since uh, case closure with DCFS. Um, we look for parents who have really made the changes, internalized changes, um, and, and have a lot to give back to parents. Um, every, every parent partner that we've had has seen the benefit of DCFS involvement. Um, so that has, that has not been an issue. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, back to you, um, Alice. 
um, have you been able to engage, or have you been able to get the families, um, foster and birth, to engage in these visits? Um, yeah, uh, kind of. There's we've done training. Um, we have done you know foundational work with that, and uh, the the information that we provide to them is about the benefit and the outcomes like Gloria talked about, um, that the practice is beneficial to, to them, to their children, to case managers, to, um, to management, to case planning. So we've, we've done a lot of work about why it's good to, to, to make the switch to that. But also, um, we have an expectation that people will participate. So you, you don't really get to opt out. Uh, you don't get to pick and choose about, well, I'll do this type of visitation here, and I won't do it here. Uh, certainly, we were, um, you know, we've discussed about there are aberrations and there are situations where the, this kind of visitation just generally where the foster parent is supervising the visit, or a coach is not there, or maybe somebody's brand new, or a parent has particular issues, um, you know, maybe extreme violence or uh, extreme mental health, uh, untreated uh, substance abuse issues, something like that, or you know, extreme problem, you know, personality conflict, something that we haven't been able to work through, and we have to pull back on some of those supervision issues. Um, it, you know, people are human, and it's not just so structured that there's no um, kind of individuality, but the, the engagement part, we haven't found foster parents or bio um, families who haven't really wanted to do it. There are some barriers. You've got six kids in your house, and you've got six dis different visitation plans. Um, just logistically, we've had to afford people some help to do that, but um, we are still working on that. But we don't really have people that say, you know what, I'm out, I'm not going to do it, because our expectation is you will, and people find that the benefits of it are um, really quite positive. Great, thank you. And we have a couple more questions for, for you, Alice. Um, is the mentor, the caregiver, foster parent, or someone else? Uh, the, initially, the, the coach um, so is a, is a paraprofessional, is a staff person, so it's not a social worker, but um, it's, a, it's a staff person here. And then the, the intent is that the, eventually the foster parent who knows the model will be the the person in the room, will be the coach. So as you get more familiar with it, we have foster parents who are really good at it, like Gloria, and she can manage it, and she doesn't need a coach. She doesn't need a prompt and um, can, can do that by herself. But um, some foster parents obviously are new or it's a really challenging placement. So that coach is that paraprofessional staff person. Great, thank you. And I have one more question, Alice, and I'm just going to give one more plug. We have a few more minutes. If there's any other questions, please feel free to type those in the participant chat. Um, but the last question I have for you is, has this model of visitation had an impact on reentry rates? Uh, I don't have firm data on reentry. Um, I certainly have anecdotal um, situations where Foster parents um, are, because of the relationship that has been developed, foster parents are, um, and relatives are support people for, and, and because of that strong relationship that they've developed with bio families, um, they, they are, they intercede, they are the people that the bio families turn to. Um, when things get stressful, um, they, we have stories and documentation of foster parents, uh, caregivers providing child care, providing respite, getting phone calls. I know that, Gloria, you want to speak about that uh, real briefly, about people being there for bio families and kind of helping them out in the stress of their kids being returned to them. 
Um, so like Alice said, we don't have a lot of firm data on this, but we do know that this model has, prevent, has provided opportunities for almost like family preservation efforts, where by in establishing that relationship and becoming that support, rather than a young mom going back to using in a stressful situation, she knows that she can call a previous foster parent and say, wow, you know, it's a hard day, baby's got a fever, baby's crying, I had to call him sick to work, my boss yelled at me, I'm just frustrated with the day, here's how I feel, and be talked through that. Or when other major life things happen that, you know, child care can be provided and everything is safe, just any level of support that keeps the parent on the path that they need to be on for their child to not reenter care kind of becomes the role of the foster parent after reunification following this model. Um, that being said, of course, if there was something going on that the child was in any kind of jeopardy, we would, of course, report that back to the agency. Great. Thank you to you both so much. All right, well, we've come to the end of our time, so I wanted to give a huge thank you to all of our presenters um, that were on the call today and prepared for this webinar to, to give all this fa fabulous information about your guys' programs, and a special thank you to our parents and foster parents who were able to share their experience. I think it's so very helpful to hear all of that. So um, I just wanted to put a plug in. Um, we have an evaluation link if you all can um, give us feedback on this webinar. Um, we always like to hear the feedback and, and work to improve our webinars. So thank you all very much um, for coming today. Um, you Please let us know if you have any other questions that come up after this. Um, and thank you again for attending today.